Hello and welcome to If You Love This Planet. My guest today is Arnie Gunderson, an energy advisor with Fairwinds Associates, a company which provides research, analysis and paralegal services around environmental and energy issues. An independent nuclear engineering and safety expert, Arnie provides testimony on nuclear operations, reliability, safety and radiation issues to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, congressional and state legislatures, and government agencies and officials throughout the US, Canada and internationally. He's been a leading voice globally about the impact of the Fukushima nuclear disaster and he joins us now. Arnie Gunderson, welcome to If You Love This Planet. Hi, Helen. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Arnie, we haven't talked for about five weeks. You're a regular on this program now and people seem to love to hear you uh, because I think they all really want to know what is going on in Fukushima. So can you bring us up to date now, um, after five weeks, about the latest findings and, uh, and problems at Fukushima, Ani? Um, well, I think the single biggest thing that happened on the plant site is, the, um, uh, is that TEPCO announced that um, a large part of the nuclear core melted down from uh, its normal position and melted through the nuclear reactor. Um, it, it seems that Unit 1 is worse than Unit 2 and 3, but here's what happened. Um, when a nuclear reaction ends, when the control rods fall in, 5% of the heat is still there, not from any nuclear fission, but from all those leftover radioactive isotopes called fission products. So. 5% doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're cranking out um, you know, 500 megawatts like Unit 1 was, 5% is still you know, 25 megawatts. It's, it's, a, it's a big number. Define a megawatt, Arnie. Well, uh, a megawatt is a, is a thousand kilowatts. It's a million, a million watts, right? Yes, it's a million watts. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so, um, or it's um, a thousand 100 watt volts, you know, something like that is one megawatt. Um, so the, uh, there's a lot of extra heat that has to be gotten rid of. And uh, Unit 1 failed to get heat into the nuclear, uh, failed to get water to cool the heat in the nuclear core real early in the accident. And um, the fuel began to disintegrate. Uh, in the process, it cranked out an enormous amount of hydrogen gas. And the, um, the net effect was it exploded. We all saw that on the very second day, March 14th. Um, and then uh, after that, of course, uh, it was obvious that the core had collapsed, and that's a meltdown. Now, uh, some for the longest time, I was saying that it was melting through the nuclear reactor, but TEPCO was saying, no, it didn't get out of the nuclear reactor. In fact, it's likely that it got out of the nuclear reactor um, within a day. Uh, well, describe the, describe the nuclear reactor vessel. What is it? How thick is it? What is it made of, Arnie? Well, the, the bottom of the nuclear reactor is a, is a bowl, and it's about 8 inches thick. So that's, um, oh, I'm converting here, Helen, 30 centimeters um, Made of thick. what? Made of what? And it's made of um, a steel. Yeah. Um, but in a boiling water reactor, it's got 64 holes in the bottom of it for the control rods to go in and out. And what I believe happened is that the, the, the nuclear core, the molten blob at the bottom of the reactor, didn't have to melt its way through eight inches of concrete. And, of course, TEPCO's position is, well, it took a long time to melt through those eight inches of concrete. Concrete so or steel? Position, steel? Oh, steel. 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 I, sorry. Uh, yeah. I need my cup of coffee here. Uh, uh -huh. But uh, my position is that it went through one of the holes, and oh. the holes are easily accessible, and it would have drizzled out like um, soft ice cream. Oh. Um, and if one hole failed, it's one thing, but if a whole bunch of holes failed, uh, a lot of nuclear um, core not only escaped and, and fell to the bottom of the reactor, but also rapidly escaped from the bottom of the nuclear, the, the steel, and, and got to the bottom of the uh, containment. Now, the bottom of the containment is about a meter of, um, of concrete. And um, 
by, now by this time, after about a day, instead of 5% decay heat, you're down to about 1% decay heat. But that's still, you know, 5 megawatts or 5 million watts of power. Um, and it started to melt its way into the concrete. Most likely it didn't melt concrete, but concrete pops like popcorn when it gets hot. Uh, because there's oxygen in the pop in the in the concrete, so as it got hot, it would um, pop and disintegrate, pop and disintegrate, and the core has gradually worked its way into the concrete underneath the nuclear reactor. Now, this is we're talking about 70 tons of nuclear material. This is a a large molten blob of nuclear material is underneath the reactor. The question is, uh, how deep did it go? And it, it really depends on um, when it broke through the nuclear reactor, and I think it broke through soon, but also if it, if it began to attack in a narrow area, it would form a crevice. And if it fell through more uniformly, it would form a pancake. Well, a pancake would be easy to cool because there would be a large surface area. But if a crevice was formed, it would lie in that crevice and uh, continue to work its way downward. Now, by today, so now we're eight months into the accident, and we are at less than one megawatt. So from 25 megawatts to 10 to 1, we're at less than one megawatt of decay heat. But it's, in a, um, it's now created a crater, essentially, and uh, can't be cooled from above because um, it sort of sealed itself off on, on the top. And it's um, gradually working its way uh, down into the, um, through the concrete. Now, there's a, they claim there's about 30 centimeters left, about a foot left. And um, they also claim that, of course, when it gets through the concrete, there's still about two inches of steel in the nuclear containment. That, that will melt quickly. The concrete will take a lot longer than the steel to melt. So um, it is possible that over time the core will continue to melt down um, and, and get through the, um, the, the nuclear containment. You know, but whether or not that happens, I, I think um, we're not going to have a steam explosion. The people keep talking about, well, when the core hits the groundwater, uh, there's going to be a massive steam explosion. Uh, there's not enough heat left, less than a megawatt, to cause a massive steam explosion. And I think it'll drizzle out. I think it will um, uh, gradually come in contact with water and solidify, as opposed to an enormous mass hitting water suddenly, in which case you would get a steam explosion. But um, I, I think the real key here is it doesn't matter. The nuclear core is leaking through the containment anyway. It doesn't have to melt down itself into the groundwater. There's so many leaks in that containment into other buildings and out into the ocean anyway that all of the water is in contact with the nuclear fuel. And so, therefore, the plutonium and the cesium and the strontium that's in the nuclear fuel has run throughout the entire complex anyway and is getting into the groundwater. So it's moot whether or not we have a real meltdown, melt-through China syndrome, in my opinion, we have a meltdown and a melt-through, which is core collapses, gets through the nuclear vessel. And whether or not it ever has a China syndrome doesn't matter because the groundwater is already contaminated because the containment is leaking elsewhere. That was a very long-winded beginning uh, uh, comment, Helen, and I sort of apologize for making it that long. No, it's fascinating, Annie, um, to hear from you. Now... But these are all calculations because they can't get near this molten corium nuclear mass. They don't really know what's going on. So how can they assume by which calculation, what calculations are they using to work out the data that you just presented? That, that's a great question. You know, you're right. They can't get inside the containment. The containment is so radioactive that they haven't even opened the door and let the robots in yet. They've been outside the containment, and the exposures are incredibly high. So, you know, engineers just make a series of assumptions. Well, uh, and, and there's, they can't get within 100 feet of this to verify. So there is no way of determining 
where that nuclear core really is. And um, and you're you're absolutely right. Um, you know, I, I teach geometry, and the and the word assume a s s u m e. Uh, I always tell my geometry students it makes an ass out of you and me. <laughs> Oh, well, so we don't really know. Okay, so now... Unit 2 and 3 had cooling for several hours longer. And it was uh, the first reactor had something called an isolation condenser. And that was the old, the oldest way General Electric built these reactors was just an isolation condenser. They realized early that that was not a good idea. So on the next two reactors, they put a turbine that runs on the steam created from the accident. And that worked for a couple hours longer uh, until it failed also. So they were cooled by this turbine for a little bit longer. Oh. And um, as a result, uh, TEPCO says 90% of the nuclear fuel is melted in Unit 1, and 60% has melted in, in Unit 2 and 3. It's still an enormous amount of nuclear material has broken through the nuclear reactor and is on the floor of the containment. In, but in all three in all three yeah. units, one, two, and yeah. three, yeah. Okay, now the groundwater and the amount they've put into the ocean, I, I want you to address that um, specifically now, Arnie Gunderson. Well, they had a leak um, just this week on, um, uh, in, in, their, uh, in the system that they used to purify the water, and approximately um, uh, 45... Uh, 45,000 pounds of radioactive water was released from the building and uh, got into the Pacific Ocean. And it was very high in strontium. Um, and strontium, of course, you'll remember is a bone seeker and, and uh, is, is one of the most nasty uh, chemicals that gets released from a nuclear reactor. So that was a surface leak. It, it ran out of the building, across the ground, and into the ocean. Oh, really? Got it. Yeah. That, but in addition, there's cracks in the concrete from the earthquake. You've got to remember, this site moved. It dropped a foot after the oh. earthquake. The entire land dropped. And when something you know that big moves, it's got a crack. So mm. there's cracks in the, uh, in the containment. There's cracks in the turbine building. Mm. And all of which is allowing groundwater in and radioactive water into the groundwater. So the site is becoming increasingly, um, the groundwater under the site, is becoming increasingly contaminated. And is the groundwater uh, seawater? Is it salt water? It must be because it's built right next to the ocean, right? Uh, no, it's fresh water. Oh, it's fresh the, water. The, the, the flow is from the land into the ocean. Uh. It, it just turns out that way. So that um, there's fresh water under the site and the net flow on site is out into the ocean. Now, so we're seeing whatever radioactivity is in the groundwater is also moving into the ocean. So you know, as it's been said, I said it months ago, but other people have now said it too, that this is um, the, the absolutely the largest, by at least a, a factor of 10, um, radioactive contamination of the ocean that's ever occurred in history. Well, how much do, have, has, do you estimate has been released into the Pacific Ocean in toto from, from Fukushima Daiichi? Well, the, the number I saw was uh, 30 tetra becquerels, and that's, that's 15 zeros. So put 30 with 15 zeros behind it, becquerels, and uh, that's what they believe was released into the ocean. A becquerel is a disintegration per second, but after that disintegrates, there's another one the next second, and another one the next second, and another one the next second for years. So we talk about, you know, this 30 with, with 15 zeros behind it. It's a million billion, mm. 30 million billion um, disintegrations per second continuing over the next 30 years um, have been released into the ocean. Now, is that, is that again, a calculation and an estimate? Everything's an estimate. How, how, do they, they, how do they work that out then? How do they work that out, Arnie? Um, you know, the, I, I don't like the assumptions they're using on these calculations. The, the biggest assumption is something called a decontamination factor for cesium. And they're assuming that one, only one atom out of 100 gets out of the nuclear reactor. 
and in, out of the nuclear containment, rather, and into other buildings. 